Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for another one of our virtual events. Tonight, we're going to have uh, PJ Vernon in conversation with S.A. Cosby. Um, so PJ Vernon's new book is Bath House and is highly recommended by Murder by the Book staff. We also, um, of course, have Blacktop Wasteland, which we have been talking about for a year now. It's new in paperback. And we will have... Um, Signed personalized copies. You still have time to order personalized copies of um, S.A. Cosby's new book, Razorblade Tears, um, coming up soon. I'll put a link in the comments shortly. And then we will have signed book plates for, there we go, reverse bathhouse um, very soon. Again, highly recommended. And we've had a lot of events this week. They're continuing. And um, we've partnered with Sarah DeVello for the new mystery and thriller mavens um, Facebook group. So she's doing two events every Tuesday afternoon for the foreseeable future. And um, that's pretty cool. So make sure to check out murderbooks.com for more information and authors who are coming up. There's very likely someone that you read and love that we will be chatting with soon. Um, so now for the guests tonight, let me go ahead and get um, PJ Vernon on here. Good evening. Good evening. So nice to meet you on here, and I'm so excited for this conversation. I think you and Sean are going to be just a delight to listen to if, if the pre-show is anything, uh, any indication. Let me go ahead and do your, you have a lovely short bio. I'm always appreciative of that. So let me get your, your bio, your official bio out here, and then we'll bring Sean on. Uh, PJ Vernon was born in South Carolina. His first book, When You Find Me, was published in 2018. He lives in Calgary with his partner and two wily dogs, one of which I've seen roaming around and maybe we'll see in a little bit. Maybe we'll be treated to. All right. And here is S.A. Cosby. Hi there. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so good to see you as always. Let me get you introduced as well. S.A. Cosby is an Anthony Award winning writer from Southeastern Virginia. He's the best selling author of Blast, uh, excuse me, Blacktop Wastelands, a New York Times book review editor's choice and Goodreads Choice Awards semifinalist, as well as Brotherhood of the Blade and My Darkest Prayer. When not writing, he's an avid hiker and chess player. And as I said, you can um, pre-order personalized copies of his next book that comes out very soon, as well as um, we'll have signed book plates for Bathhouse. So. Razorblade Tears, there it is, and it's fabulous. So both of these books, all these books we've talked about, so highly recommended at Murder by the Book. We're super excited about all of them. And I am going to go away and let them chat. If you have questions, put them in the live chat on YouTube and the comments here on Facebook, and I will get to them in a little bit. Don't be shy. Bye. Well, uh, let me start by saying it's let me start by saying it is so good to see you, my friend. I'm so, as we say, and you, you're from some, some South Carolina, so you know what I mean. It. I'm so proud of you. I could spit. I'm so happy for you. Uh, Bath House is an incredible book. It's an instant classic, and I can't wait for the rest of the world to uh, to experience it. Sean, Sean, essay, Sean. <laughs> I am so honored uh, <laughs> that you were willing to. Hang out with and cheers, by the way. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I uh, I am I am so like I I have been talking about like razor blade tears, blacktop wasteland, you and and just like even how we met, and I've been thinking about how we met like a lot um, this this week specifically for me with this book coming out uh, because do you, do you you remember? How oh we're yeah, like, we're, yeah. yeah. And we, yeah. we met. Oh, at, uh, yeah, we met. At, we met at Thriller Fest, and I overheard you talking about Waffle House, and the people <laughs> that you were talking to. So it sounded like they didn't know what Waffle House was. Like you were talking about Bigfoot, and I turned around and I said, "You got to be from the South because you know about Waffle House is smaller than the cover." And we instantly bonded. That was that was the beginning of our friendship. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we did over Waffle House, which, which by the way, like I had to, I had to like work into Bathhouse. Some I like verified, you know, that it exists in Indiana, where like the scene unfolds, just to make sure I can put it in there because it's so important to me. People, for folks tuning in who might not have experienced the amazingness that is Waffle House at two o'clock, a highway Waffle House at two o'clock in the morning, um, in in the South after a night out. Um, holy smokes, that's where. <laughs> 
That's where I, I became me. <laughs> oh, man. Let me tell you, there's no better place for drunk uh, 20 year olds than a roadside Wawa house at about three o'clock in the morning. It is the nexus of weird and surreal uh, action. It's like a Wawa house is like. It's it's like it's been designed by Salvador Dali, and all the and the menus are written by John Paul Sarte. But the but but the soundtrack is Waylon Jennings. That's a Waffle House, and I love them. I can't get enough of them. Okay, so like I I I don't even need to gush about like your writing and story. I'm like just off the cuff. The description of Waffle House is like beautiful and poetic, and like in just the right amount of words. Uh, it, Cause it's, it's so true. I feel like it is this surreal experience, surreal in that like at two o'clock in the morning when I only had $20 at all. Uh, and you know, I'm just like, I'm going to tip my $20 cause this was the best meal I've ever had in my entire life and wake up. There's every, like so many mornings I've woken up after Waffle House and been like, that was all the money I had. And I gave it up <laughs> for a tip. Gracious enough to tell me for the 25,000th time that there are no French fries I can get here. I can get hash browns and they'll put cheese on them, but there's no French fries, Mr. Vernon. You, you were here last Friday night and the night before with your friends. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Here's my $20. <laughs> it, I love every Waffle House, no matter, no matter where it is, there's always at least one server who is going to be your surrogate mom for the duration of your time at Waffle House. So she's gonna bring you coffee. She's gonna bring you coffee, baby, because you don't need to. You don't need to be walking out of here like that. And then she's gonna make sure that you get your smothered and covered the way you like it. Uh, she's gonna. She's gonna guide you away from the from the fist fight that's broken out over the jukebox. And she's gonna look out for you, make sure you're safe. And so I can remember being at Waffle House at uh, three o'clock in the morning, crying into my um, crying into my uh, loose meat sandwich. Over a, a lost love that I I, uh, I, I wasn't able to, uh, uh, my heart broken at, at whatever club or bar we were leaving. And one of the servers coming over there and petting me up and <laughs> treating me just like my mom was like, it's going to be all right, sugar. It's fine. So anyway, <laughs> if anybody doesn't know, we, we love Waffle House in the South. You've got to check it out. But let me, let me get back to why we're here. Uh, and we need to talk about your incredible book that's out now. If you haven't gotten it yet, please rectify that situation immediately. Bathhouse. Now, I want to say something about Bathhouse. I was very lucky to receive an early version of this book. And I still hold, when I first read it, the first thing that popped in my mind, and I, I meant it, I said, it's like reading Bathhouse is like hearing your next door neighbors argue while you're drinking Prosecco. And there's a Jeff uh, Buckley song playing in the background, and then somebody pulls a knife. And so I want to ask you, how what how did you arrive at that incredible sense of tone and suspense? Because it grabbed you from the first scene. And um, and and, and, I'm, and also, uh, uh, it's a book that is incredibly visceral and sensual. You know, it's it's a book that has you know it's. Um, an LGBTQ centered book, which is more, we need more of those, but it's, it's universal. The sensuality, the eroticism, everything in the first chapter, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're gay or straight or queer or, or non-binary, that the way you are able to tap into Oliver's sense of, of adventure, but shame, but excitement, it's incredible. So I, I want to ask you, you know, was that your intention with the first chapter? Were you really trying to just instantly grab everybody? I mean, I appreciate all of that. And I can't tell you the number of times I've been on like lives or, or panels and someone's like, it's like, it's, let me read you a blurb about your book. And I'm like, I know what the blurb it's gonna be. Um, just because that, that like, <laughs> thank you for, for that. Um, no, it, it like, exa yeah, exactly like you said, I wanted to open it up, um, you know, right in the middle of things like with, with high stakes, robust conflict. Um, and, and honestly, and I know you'll appreciate this in a way that like if a literary agent opens it um, and lets me send a chapter along that they're going to ask, they're going to maybe have to ask for the next chapter because it, it ends at a cliffhanger. Um, and so that, that part was intentional mm -hmm. and that was kind of, kind of the starting point um, 
for me. And, you know, from there and wanting to open it in that scene, I, you know, sort of worked out the characters like moral compass and where they come from and how, how I could possibly get readers within like a few pages to have empathy and root for this guy that's doing something that's so like for so many folks objectively like unsympathetic, cheating um, or attempting to cheat uh, on his partner. And, you know, as far <laughs> as like the visceral anxiety and fear, I would love to say I'm super talented and I just like could do that. Um, but I'm also just like a very anxious person who's had panic attacks over like, and so I, I'm like, I've never been like almost murdered in a bathhouse, but my body has reacted for no good reason in the middle of a grocery store as if I was. So, uh, you know, I'm just like, describe that and match the stakes. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, you really like I said uh, from the from page one, it grabs you, it, and you you like you said, it immediately sets the stakes, sets the tone, and creates a sense of empathy, um, if not sympathy for the for that for the character. But what you do right after that is also incredible because right after that we go right into the other narrative. Oliver's partner, and he's having this meeting with his mother, and you know uh, anybody who has ever um, <laughs> anyone who has ever dated somebody that their parents didn't approve of will immediately relate to the next chapter uh, as Oliver's partner is trying desperately to convince his mom that Oliver is not uh, gutter trash, and it's and you you shift gears, but not in, a, in an awkward way. You shift gears from this intense, like I said, very passionate, physical almost reaction to this very calm yet emotionally violent uh, uh, chapter. And, and you do that, constantly, you keep that tone constantly through the book. And uh, like you said, I, 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 I don't know if that was intentional, but it definitely was, uh, uh, it definitely grabbed my attention. And so um, I, I, did that concept come to you as you were writing it or was it some rewrites where we go back before, back and forth between two protagonists? Um, and can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, it um it abs so the I'm I'm sort of an underwriter. Um, are, I'm I'm getting a little bit of feedback from my uh, <laughs> headphones. So Y'all, let me know if it's if it gets too wild, and I've got a spare pair I can put in. Um, but uh, it you know it started um with it was just Oliver's story. I'm an underwriter. That's like my my weak spot. I like my drafts. Um, I can finish them fast because they're underwritten. Um, and they sort of like read like screenplays uh, and you know, I'll have like insert action beat here later or like, you know, uh, insert clever thing here at some point. Um, and you know, so originally it was, it was this kind of like bare bone, not bare bones, but this, this manuscript that was exclusively tethered to Oliver. So Oliver Park, uh, this messy um, queer kid from uh, a rural town um, in, in the Midwest um, where he has overcome a variety of challenges and well, to varying degrees of success, overcome a variety of challenges, including, you know, toxic men and, and a bad family situation, um, only to fall into to other sorts of toxic situations and, and issues with, you know, opioid addiction and, and those kinds of um, those kinds of things. And so then, you know, that was the story. It was it was him and how he uh, met Dr. Nathan Klein, the other point of view that you're you're talking about, this older by 10 years, well-adjusted, successful, uh, ostensible, by every way society uh, is successful, um, who leads a very structured life from sort of this moneyed East Coast family, nothing Oliver could possibly um, ever relate to. Um, and when I, I took a call uh, with, with the editor who would eventually uh, acquire um, bathhouse, which is, which is Rob Bloom at Doubleday. Um, and, you know, he said, I love the book so much. It's got the bones, the organs, the, the heart, the tissue, all that. We need a little bit of connective tissue, uh, to really make it pop, which is, you know, I, for me, like how I know, I don't know if it's the same way for you, but I'm like, that's, it's in the right hands now because someone's able to see those things and be like, this is amazing. Let's make it like 11 instead of 10. Um, and, and you just, you love to, you love to hear it. And so I, I went back in and, and thought, how can I, how can I, uh, elevate this story? Well, who has the most to lose in so many of these different chapters and scenes? And in many of them, they're Oliver, but in so many more, they're his, you know, a sensible husband, um, who's got a savior syndrome, who's, who's, you know, maybe a little bit more controlling than he should be in trying to keep Oliver on the straight and narrow. Um, and as soon as I started getting into his head, uh, listening to the music he would listen to, trying to get into 
um, that mindset of I'm a fixer because in real life I don't fix shit like ever. <laughs> so I'm trying to like think about uh, people who, well, that people do, I'm told, uh, I, I hear. <laughs> um, and, you know, as soon as I got that on the page and got his story on the page, the whole book just leveled up. Um, because now it, it was so much more three dimensional. The narrative was so much more powerful. Uh, have it, having him on. So he was a late ad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> See, I lock my cat out. My cat's my cat. My cat will scratch at the door eventually. Um, but uh, also, I want to talk about uh, another thing about the book. I love the book unabashedly. So, um, and the book is un. And I and and, and I, I want to ask this question. I think we I can because we're friends. But the book is so unapologetically. Would it be okay if I use the word queer? Is that okay? Are you comfortable? With we that? Bo- we bonded over the word otter, which I feel like we got to get into at some point. So yeah, that yeah. <laughs> and I want people to know that was that was immediately after our conversation about Waffle House. We started talking about gay slang because I was working on Raised Blade Tears. So and. And I owe you incredible debt of gratitude for your help with that. But um, anyway, <laughs> the book is unabashedly queer in a way that I don't think many books, especially in crime fiction, are today. And I think that's an incredible. But also, you take it, you're taking on a lot of other subjects as well. Like you were talking about the difference in class, ageism, um, that that toxicity in a relationship, and almost that. I feel like Nathan is almost in some ways. A, a, a toxic, positive person to a certain degree, to a certain degree. I mean, that, that's just my inference. And so, and I get this question a lot when people ask me about Raised Blade Tears, but were you writing this as a book that like was like big message or were you looking at the microcosm of the two characters and what they have to lose? And I think I know the answer, but I'd be curious to hear you talk about it. Yeah, I mean, for for me, it was it was literally the micro at first, right? It was like the microcosm of like I I love thrillers, I love domestic noir and, and domestic suspense and all those uh, those kinds of stories that are voyeuristic and relatable and happen in the home and the like. You know, people scare the hell out of me way more than a whole lot of other things. Um, out, you know, in, in stories uh, ever possibly could. I'm like Sauron, no problem, got him covered. Um, but like, you know, the, the, the Adora, the mom from Sharp Objects is a real problem for me. Um, and, you know, I felt like that's the story. Oh, yeah. That's what, that's what I wanted to tell. Um, and I wanted to tell, you know, the same kind of book that, that any other thriller um, writer would, which meant, you know, that I get to draw on the well of like lived experiences that all other authors, you know, um, draw from uh, to create these stories. And, you know, it just, it that's where I started. And from a plotting standpoint and a characterization standpoint, all of that kind of fit into place. And it was, I have ADHD, so I don't think about things until it's too late usually. Like I'm, I'm like, this is the book I'm doing and it's gonna look like this. Um, and, and then after I'm sort of like, there's so much more here. Um, there's so much more going on. Um, there's <laughs> Chauncey again. Chauncey's been like bomb- bombing all my. Yeah. Like, all my like, Come here, buddy. He agrees. Um, he agrees. And, <laughs> and, uh, and and so you know, I started with like uh, trying to. Oh my gosh, she's like, not give it up. Come here, but um, I got him when I was single, so I've cultivated him to be be this way. <laughs> uh, and, and I get on Zoom now years later, and I'm just like, he never does this. I don't know what happened. Um, but like, our, like I mean, I don't. You know this way better than I do just you know just as it's like you can't separate like if you try to write like you know Blacktop Wasteland a phenomenal phenomenal book that you know had me sweating you know way more than I am right now in this hot room upstairs with a, the fan on uh for, for all the best reasons same thing with Razor Blade Tears um it it's not it, it's who you are and who you are I guess involves commentary to a lot of folks um, mm-hmm. and so it, it comes along for the ride and I only kind of appreciated how much of, of that I put into it that maybe my heart knew, but my head didn't quite, wasn't quite caught up yet. Um, but yeah, I've, I've got things to say too about, uh, you know, the queer community in general and how homogenous it is in so many, in mm-hmm. so many places and how this, the classism and all the stuff you were talking about, um, and you know, absolutely uh, work their way into into this narrative because that's 
that's the community I know um, and I've experienced and friends have experienced mm -hmm. and, and I would like to be able to include that in fiction uh, of any kind, even a, even a thriller. Exactly. I mean, I think for me, people always ask me that question, too. And it's like, you know, the the microcosm, the macrocosm is, yes, I'm, I'm with Blacktop or I'll talk about Razor Blade Tears. Razor Blade Tears, I'm talking about, you know, the issues, which are, you know, redemption and homophobia and prejudice and, you know, the possibility of change and grief. Um, but in the microcosm, it's a story about people who are suffering, who have gone through loss. And so, like you said, when I sit down and write a book, my first impulse is to tell that story. And then by telling that story, then I can grab the various pieces of the larger issues that I want to talk about and insert them. But it doesn't work unless you have that foundation. In my, for me, you know, it, you know, uh, to quote, uh, to quote uh, uh, Mary Poppins, a little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down. So if I can tell an interesting story <laughs> to grab you in, then we can talk about the larger issues. But the story is the foundation and the story of Bathhouse is thrilling and also i was shocked at how scary it is it is you know there were times when i was reading it where i was genuinely scared for oliver it's like oh my god that dude is around the corner get in the house why are you messing with your keys get in the house and so <laughs> it was like talking back to a movie and so um <laughs> but but on a, on a serious note as you said, you know, you know, I, and I, you know, I'm someone who has suffered a little bit of anxiety myself, and and everything. I think, you know, like you said, you're drawing on that well of personal experience. There were scenes in Bathhouse where I, I wanted to ask you, and I've had the chance. It's like, wow, this feels really personal. This feels really not that it happened to you, you know, uh, actually, but you're drawing from something that was really a, a, a deep emotional well. And I guess my question is. Um, do you feel do you feel like writing that way? Do you feel like it's it's putting yourself out there, like you know you're sort of you know you're naked to the world, or do you feel like as a writer you have enough distance between the personal experience and the fictional world that you're creating that that's not an issue? Yeah, I mean, I think like my like gut gut reaction to that question is um, you know. If, if I've experienced a, a particular feeling or anxiety or anything else um, that, you know, is is working its way into a scene or the drafting process, like if I'm, if it just happened a week ago, uh, there's no way I'm, I'm going to be able to touch, you know, uh, <laughs> right. any of that. Like, you know, every, I don't know how many times you've heard this, but it's like, oh, it's like the whole world's falling apart. Like such great fodder. Um, for for all your books and all the dark stuff that's coming, and I'm like, great. After I unpack it with a therapist for a decade, I'll come back to it and and maybe you know <laughs> create a fun story um, out right. of it. Um, but it's so you know, I, I think if there's no way I could have written Bathhouse, you know, when I was in in college or grad school, and you know, I sort of had a little bit of a mm -hmm. delayed. Uh, uh, I don't know what the word, like a delayed uh, growing up because you're still in school a little bit longer. Um, and, you know, mm. but at the end of the day, there are only so many, like there's, a, there's everyone, every human being has access to the same repertoire of, of emotions, right? So there are situations in my life, in your life, in all of our lives where I'm like, oh, I felt humiliated. I felt different. I felt ashamed or I felt loved or betrayed or whatever else. Um, and so that feeling, it doesn't matter how you get, I mean, it matters how you get to that feeling for, for obvious uh, uh, reasons. But once you get past how you get, like, that's just a human feeling. Um, and so I could sort of apply that yeah. um, to, to new situations that, that have sort of, uh, that are obviously way more high stakes and more interesting than stuff that's happened in my life. But yeah, you know, we're authors, stuff is sticky. When you hear, when you experience something, when your friends or your family experience something or telling you about it, there are always those details that stick with you. And, you know, as, as like a storyteller, we're just like, well, if they stuck with me, that's definitely uh, something that might stick with other folks too, if, if it finds its way into, into a book. Oh yeah. Like, like for me, uh, 
people always ask me about blacktop. They're like, oh my God, is that taking me your true life? Well, no, I've, I've never been a getaway driver for a jewelry heist. But <laughs> that being said, I, you know, I, I, you know, my, my parents uh, separated at Earth when I was young and I had a, a complicated relationship with my dad. And so I took little bits of my personal experience and then amplified them to 11 to create the story. And uh, for me, uh, Blacktop Wasteland was very cathartic. And I wonder, was Bathhouse a cathartic a book for you? And the reason I ask that is because I've read your first, your other book, uh, When You Find Me, which is an incredible Southern Gothic mystery thriller uh, that is uh, an incredible book. I love it. I, like I said, I remember reading it. I felt like, I felt reading that book like I felt about reading Cotton Mouse by Kelly J. Ford. I was oh, like, God. oh man, this is Southern as hell. I can, I can smell the grass clippings and, and I can hear the crickets. Um, but it felt like reading Bathhouse that this was, and I'm not trying to put too fine a point on it, but it felt like, no, this is PJ. This is PJ um, really um, coming into himself. And, and, I, I, and I don't mean to assume anything with that, um, but it just, it just, it's such a powerful book. And I mean, did you feel that way? Like it was sort of a catharsis for you? A billion percent. And actually, I was having this thought the other day. Um, so I, I, you know, appreciate this question so much. I, it does feel like um, it was the opportunity. I mean, I, I, I write, obviously, like, like we were just talking about, first and foremost, to entertain folks and stories are for other people. But obviously, there's something I get out of it, um, or, or it's too hard um, to do. Uh, and, you know, I, that was a story um, that I felt like I couldn't tell. Um, I, I restricted myself from telling it early on. My initial, like, you know, gut was to center when you find me on a gay couple, because again, you know, that's what I know um, more uh, so than than anything else. But I was I was afraid that people wouldn't buy it, um, that it wouldn't, you know, it would be relegated to the diversity table instead of just the table table um, with everyone else. Um, and and you know, when I actually was able to liberate myself and write a story where I let myself access all the tools I had on, on my tool belt of being me, um, it was incredibly cathartic. And only just a few days ago on the back end of the launch, on the back end of all that uh, stuff that was going on, I was going for a walk in the neighborhood like I do like 18,000 times a day. Um, and I thought to myself, <laughs> it does feel like I, I got to say something and I got to, there was a catharsis and I had to, and I got to get it out. Um, a bill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, it's just weird that you asked that. Cause it's like a few days ago, I was like, that was cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, it shines through. It's an incredible piece of work. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask you because like, so with blacktop wasteland and I, and I want to get into razor blade tears too. <laughs> it's a phenomenal story. Um, but like, did, did you feel like when, I, cause when we first met and yeah, we bonded over Waffle House, we bonded over um, you having done your research and knowing what an otter was and gay vernacular, and I, you know, which was awesome. Um, like, did you feel like, you know, you had just, you had just gotten some pretty good news that day. Um, when we met that, that or like earlier that day and bathhouse was on submission and it felt very encouraging to me to like, cause you, you think things are impossible until you see someone else do them in front of you. And you did, you had done, you had gotten some great news and it felt like, Oh, well, people are doing this. You know, this is, this is encouraging. Like, did you feel cathartic uh and, and that you were able to get get that out there into the world um and did you realize it immediately or did it kind of come to you later it it didn't hit me till later like when we met at thriller fest in, in 2019 and we uh bonded over waffle house but then we went out uh, uh you and i and alexia gordon and kelly garrett and uh, my partner we went out for drinks later and we were sitting there talking and having a great conversation one best conversation i had that week and it started to hit me when you were talking about a bathhouse being on submission. And it started to hit me like, wow, here's an African-American man and a, a, a gay man. And we're talking about books that I don't know if 10 or 15 years ago, people would have been looking for or been willing to take a chance on. And it started to hit me a little bit then. And then when the book came out, it really 
slammed into me like, wow, this is a story I've been wanting to tell like you for a long time, a story that I didn't know if I could tell it correctly and in a way that was was compassionate but not condescending. And so, uh, yeah, it was an incredible weight off my shoulders when it came out because I was like, no matter what happens, I told the story I wanted to tell. Razorblade Tears was different because I was telling a story that um, is is separate a little bit from my purview to a certain extent. Um, but again, I wanted to tell a story that was compassionate and not condescending. And so I, you know, tried to do my research. I, I talked to people from the community. I talked to people who had experienced the things that my characters may have had, had experienced. And the fact that Raceway Tears is coming out in a couple of weeks and Bathhouse is out now and they're both, you know, I can say it, I, you know, like, I know we're both Southern, but I'm gonna brag a little bit on both of us that they're both getting incredible reviews and incredible attention. It makes me feel like if there's not a paradigm shift, there is something happening, you know, at the foundation of publishing that those books can come out and that people can appreciate what we're trying to do. And they're very different books, but at the end of the day, they're also talking about similar things about love and acceptance and about being your true version of yourself. And um, for me, I, like I said again at the top of the hour, it's an incredible moment for me to see all this happening in Bathhouse because nobody deserves it more. This is a special book, and I hope people realize it. And um, it's, I'm just so proud of you that that you're able to be the full version of yourself. And uh, and also thank you for all your help with Razorblade Tears. I, there was you gave me some really invaluable advice, and I gotta say it here and now. There's a scene in Razorblade Tears. I'm not giving anything away where my two protagonists get into a fight. Um, they go to a gay bar. They're they're investigating the murder of their, their 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 gay sons, and these two older men, one black, one white, who are very uncomfortable and 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 honestly, you know, pretty prejudiced. And they're coming to learn that they're prejudiced. And they go to this gay bar and they get into an argument and a fight. And you gave me a great piece of advice. You said, I don't even know if you remember saying this, but you said, you know, I like this scene, but a fight at a gay bar is a fight like every every other bar. You know, it's nothing different. And that was a wake up moment for me. It's like, even with all my good intentions, I was not giving my characters the full benefit of their truth. And so I appreciate that. So any any good things in Razorblade come from people like PJ Vernon, any of the mistakes are mine and mine alone. So <laughs> I, I, I got, I, I mean, I appreciate that, um, but I, I did nothing but like, like, again, read, read this book and sweat into the couch and like just feel um so the the i and i told like i told you like literally the end of like again spoiler free but the climb and i don't have like the fancy arc that everyone's got and they're taking pictures of i got away from my finished copy but i have like um the like arciest of arcs like the computer uh straight from uh um, from computer that i've read so i can't take pictures of this uh, for folks, but I know I'm, I'm getting my first time soon. Um, but, but that story, like the story of Ike and Buddy Lee, um, and their two, their two gay queer sons in an interracial relationship. Um, and, and, you know, think bad things happen, um, to them. And it's these, these two fathers and their families and trying to like this, this quest for figuring out like, yeah, there's the, 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 reaction of like i want a reckoning like i want someone has to pay for this someone has hurt and taken something from me um and someone from me um that is you know cannot go unanswered however however the characters choose to answer it um in the narrative but there's a separate thing which is a a sadness but i mean this and i hope you take this in 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 the way it's been there, i felt a very deep sadness but the kind of sadness that i come to a book to experience um, there have been a lot of times in, in my own life, and I've heard from other folks too who have read Razor Blade Tears. I was talking to um, Dennis at, at Scared Straight Reads on a live the other day who loved um, uh, Razor Blade Tears as well. Um, and it's this idea that you are who you are, and a lot, and sometimes there are folks who are in your family who you're, you know, have been around you your whole life who don't, who, who, don't, who aren't down for that ride. Um, and I remember so many times thinking, like we could stop regrets now if, if we could have a conversation before it's too late, before life happens or any anything happens. Because any of us, something horrible, could we, we could all suffer a bad fate five minutes from now. 
Um, we can't control that. But what we can control is making sure we don't have regrets and making sure we love each other and we and we are listening to each other and we're having empathy and we're working through these and being there for each other. And to be able to see Ike and Buddy Lee like take that journey after the tragedies that they endured in that story um, was cathartic for me as a reader in, in a very different kind of way. Um, obviously, you're you're a born storyteller. The, the prose is like out of this world. Like again, your tweets are written better than my book, um, which I, I'm studying and learning. From them. But but like, so you got that part, and and of course, anytime like a tool appears on any of your pages in any anything you ever write or read or, or do, I'm always like, oh sh shit. He mentioned that there was a hammer <laughs> like hanging from the wall a couple scenes ago. He's this is he knows what he's doing, so it's not like he just felt like telling us there was a hammer <laughs> there, and uh, and it won't work its way very um, effectively uh, <laughs> into the story. That's other. But what I really took away from it, <laughs> I, I I could go on forever. But what I really took away That's from a, it was it's, a, it's, a deep. Just a, a a deep sadness, but also a very um, fulfilling, like heartwarming experience when I when I made it to the end of that story when the eighty piece orchestra was over and <laughs> everyone was it, it, the fall. Every, every, I was collecting a, myself. <laughs> couch. I, I like to call it a I like to call it Chekhov's hammer or Chekhov's shovel. I you if it if it appears in the book is going to get used later. Um, but no, thank you for saying that because that's a big part of the book. I mean, the part, <laughs> there is, you know, violence and action and revenge and redemption and that, that, that nearly biblical reckoning. But at the end of the day, for me, the book is really about grief and regret. And, you know, that, that I can buddy lead these two, I'll give everybody the elevator pitch. I can buddy lead these two ex-cons, one black, one white, um, their their sons are, are a tragedy happens to their son and they didn't have a good relationship with their son because they didn't accept their sons for who they were and through the course of the book if i've done my job correctly these characters learn it doesn't matter who you love as long as they love you back it doesn't matter who you lay down with at night as a father or a brother or a cousin or a friend as long as those people love the people that you love and and the fact that it takes a tragedy for them to go on that journey is it's sad it is sad but it's something i think happens all too often in real life and so what are we as, as storytellers if not you know the seekers of truth and you know the the arrangers of 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 providence you know and i think that's my job as a storyteller something that doesn't happen in real life because i'm telling the story i can make it happen i can make a father who's homophobic realize the error of his ways at the same time, telling a story where, you know, people get, you know, their heads caved in with uh, garden tools. But, um, but so thank you for that. I appreciate all your help and I appreciate all your support. Um, another thing I wanted to say about Bathhouse, you're talking about my pros. You want to do this thing in Bathhouse that I love and I'm, it's very difficult for me to do. You have incredibly tight, but sentences that convey a lot of emotion in a, in, in a few words. Um, there's a scene that I've, I've heard you read from it in multiple readings uh, toward, I don't say the middle of the book, but we're a little ways in the book where Oliver is talking about his regret, his regret for going to the bathhouse, his regret for trying to cheat on Nathan. And he has this great, you have you read this great scene where he's talking about he's essentially going to do something in a hotel room. Uh, and I don't want to give anything away, but the way you write, write those scenes, those sentences are very short and clipped, but they convey so much emotion. Is that, is that an active part of your style? Is that something that you look to do intentionally? Or is that just something naturally that happens as you write? Because I'm the exact opposite. I, I have a run-on sentence, and it's like Usain Bolt is at the end of that joke or carrying a period all the way to the end of the page. And so I was just curious. And <laughs> But there's a tool in there, and it's not a checkoff tool because it's getting used. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I just like voice it. Like, our voices are our voices. It's like a, it's like a, a thumbprint. Like, I don't. I didn't design my thumbprint. I don't know um, why it looks the way it does, or why you know. Just like I, like the way my words come out. I'm not, you know, and I'm off. I think I'm a little bit of a better writer than I am a speaker. 
um, because I've got the time to sit, sit with them, but, but they do come out that way. They come out very like, um, I don't know, fragmented and, and punchy. Cause that's what I'm feeling in the moment. Like I'm feeling anxiety or I'm feeling fear or excitement or like whatever. And I'm just an over excitable person. Like in real life, as you know, I just will get spun up really easily and, and sound like a balloon, like with air, like letting out of it, getting let out of it. Um, but that's, I don't know. That's, it just feels natural to me. And then I've got to go back and fix it and add predic or add subjects to all those <laughs> predicates that I, I decided, you know, I was going to be literary and didn't need um, and try to like tone it down a little bit so that it is consumable um, by people who maybe aren't like come opening the book with their heart rate at, you know, 160 or whatever. Um, so it, it feels <laughs> natural, I guess. I, I, mean, will, I will attest to the fact that in person, <laughs> I will attest to the fact that in person, you once we've had a few whiskeys, you talk very similar to the way you write. And the more whiskeys you drink, the more your syntax takes on your writing. <laughs> and then and then also I think I think this is fair to say, both of us, the more we drink, the more the South comes out of us. Cause I, I know at Bouchicon in twenty nineteen in Dallas, uh toward the end of the final night. We we were sounding like an episode of Hee Haw. So <laughs> I I literally I thought before before we jumped onto this, I was like I was like people aren't gonna believe you when you all of a sudden start like getting right back into the swing of things. Cause well, I mean, it was I spent so many years like trying to escape the South, right? Cause I I felt like it wasn't space for me there. And the first chance I got, I headed somewhere else. And that meant like also trying to ex like cut away everything I possibly could. Now I'm in a different place in my life and I under I understand and appreciate it for the darkness and the light. It made me who I am. Um but uh but yeah I was like I I'm gonna try not to slip right back into that <laughs> because yeah, get a couple of drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just be glad we made it. I'm good if I'm not. If I'm... <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> we didn't get in trouble yet. Oh, oh, because yeah. I, I mean, I got some spicy hot takes if we want to go there. I mean, yeah, it's like I mean, <laughs> I've had half a glass of wine. That's good enough for me. <laughs> No, I think I think now I, I'll tell you this. I love in bath. I love in bathhouse how the beginning scene. And this is my spicy hot take for bathhouse. Like I said, the beginning scene. I remember sitting there reading it when you sent it to me, and I was like, man, like it was like I had. To, it was like it was weird. Like I'm a, I'm a straight guy. I'm heterosexual, but the beginning scene is like, wow. If I was gay, I would be so turned on right now. This is so hot. This is so intense. It's like <laughs> it's like it's incredible. I mean, wow, man. I can appreciate it, but at the same time, it's like this is some this I remember reading the first chapter. I'm like, wow, man, this is this is intense. This is some deep stuff going on here. And I'm like, and like for Oliver, it's like I, I felt I, I will say this. I haven't, I, I'm not saying I cheat on anybody, but I've been in a situation where I've been excited and nervous the same way Oliver was. And then, you know, all jokes aside, that's the universality of the book. Now, anybody can feel that. But I think anybody that has ever been in a club, you know, and you're you're going out on a mission, you can understand how Oliver feels. So that's my spicy hot take at the end of this scotch glass. <laughs> there you go. There, I mean, it's we got a billion years of evolution behind us compelling you know this sort of this sort of thing and and i appreciate I, like if i ever come across a review from like you know another you know uh gay man like myself is just like this wasn't hot i don't i don't buy this i'm just gonna be like well sean did and, and he really had to so, you know, there was a lot of reasons why he wouldn't have uh, but i i remember getting that text and I, it made me feel so good because i was like it, it gets back to this whole idea of like it's a human thing right and i'm like People will be yeah, able yeah. to access and enjoy this because it's the same feeling that they get. Like you described, you've been in situations like that in a club uh, and getting excited or, or whatever else. Um, that's a that's something we all experience. And so it was really cool to hear that you oh, yeah. uh, had that hot take <laughs> on it. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, man. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this. So I, I, I love the fact that, you know, um, Oliver is this character who is – such a mess. He's such a mess, you know. And I've known people like Oliver in my life. I've had I've had 
friends like Oliver who call me up at three o'clock in the morning is like, can you come get me? I'm over somebody's house that I don't need to be at. And <laughs> it's like, they, you know, I've had to call, I've had a phone call from a friend was like, Hey man, like, uh, she just, uh, she just pulled out a mask and a whip and I'm not really down for this. Can you come get me? So, <laughs> so Oliver's that messy friend, but I, I, I feel like after I read the book, I really just, I really want to just, Put my arms around him like a big brother. I'm like, man, get your shit together. Come on, man. You, you, and I, I love that you did that. He's not the, he's not the perfect protagonist. You know, he can be somewhat unlikable to a certain degree, but you, 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 you love him in spite of his flaws and imperfections. And I, that's not easy. That's that's very difficult for a writer to do. And you, you made it look easy. And I think that's the true definition of skill is taking some complex and making it look simple. And you really do because. On any other given occasion, Oliver is somebody I may like cross the bar to get away from. But of course, yeah. the book I'm pulling for him, I'm rooting for him. I literally, literally like, I literally want him to get away. And, it's, it, and you do this other thing where you put us in this weird position, PJ, where we're rooting for him to get away with almost cheating. And it's like I feel <laughs> conflicted. It's like, oh, I want him to get away, but I feel bad about it. Oh, I gotta go to church. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go, go, go to church. Go to church. I, I'm like, well, don't pretend like you don't know what that is, what, what like what that is, and what what skill set that is, because we've got like I can buddy. Lee, yeah. There's a bunch of reasons why I'm rooting for them to commit murder. <laughs> um, you know, I, that's not a spoiler. That's like my feeling at the beginning, like very, very early on in the book. I'm rooting for them. I'm like, did you know there's a hammer? Like, I remember there was one uh, three pages <laughs> earlier, and this person's got it. And so it's that is a like that is something that is just the that is the most unsympathetic behavior in a vacuum that I, you know, that I could imagine to take someone else's life, but the way that it's why it's like the setup, like, why are they there? How do we get there? And how the hell did you make me as a reader come along for it? You know, through like you had to answer the question of like, well, does Oliver have to deserve to die for cheating in the bathhouse? Maybe find out. I'm like, I know some people that deserve like some, some revenge, uh, in razor blade tears, and I'm here for it all the way through. And then I have to examine my own personal intrusive thoughts and more. <laughs> so well, you you a, know what you're reader, doing. Another thing that I <laughs> thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Um, as a reader, another thing that I liked about Bathhouse, um, a lot of people don't notice. Like you, like you see me. You know, I'm a big old uh, ashy knuckle country boy, and you would think, I, but I love, you would think I would like a certain type of book, and I read all kinds of books, but I love the fact that you create this very sophisticated, this very uh, 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 urbane uh, and erudite world for Oliver and Nathan to inhabit. You know, the, the scenes with Nathan at the restaurant with his mom, or, or the scenes at their house, and the neighborhood they live in. It is a world that I don't necessarily, I haven't necessarily experienced, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm halfway a hermit. I live on the boondocks, but I love that you create in these layers upon layers of their neighborhood and their life together and how it, and how it impacts the, the plot and how it impacts them as characters. You know, you were talking about Nathan and we haven't talked about him a lot, but like I said, Nathan is somebody, initially I have a lot of sympathy for Nathan, but as the book goes on, it's like, wow, you know, Nathan can, is a little hard to live with. Yeah. Ostensibly he's this great catch for Oliver, but there's, and I'm not going to give away anything away, but there's, there's more to Nathan than meets the eye. And I think, you know, was that a reflection of just your, you know, uh, uh, cause you're an incredibly intelligent, erudite, sophisticated person. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and also from the South and, and for anybody listening, those two things are not mutually exclusive. There's a lot of erudite, sophisticated people that come from the South. You know, we got Faulkner and Alice Walker, so don't, don't look down on us too much. But, um, I think that I just love that you were able to create that atmosphere. And so I guess to, to shorten my question, how important was atmosphere to you as you crafted the story? Yeah. I mean, atmosphere is everything. Um, I, I was, I've got a private chat, uh, <laughs> we were talking earlier about having a safe word when, when, if we're getting in too much trouble or, or running away. Um, but I'll try to keep it, keep it short. It's incredibly important. And, um, I, I actually had read, you know, that you had answered a question about atmosphere as well, um, in Razorblade Tears. And it's, it is the same sort of thing. It's, it's, 
it's the constrictive cage, or I guess that sometimes the wide open space, depending on what you want the reader to feel, um, that keeps everything tense. And so as long as everything was uncomfortable, um, I thought about bathhouses or, or just, you know, in general water and steam and like condensation on glass and sweat and humidity and all that dank, dank damp, Mm -hmm. All those words people hate, like damp and moist and like whatever else. Um, <laughs> yeah. Moist. It, I mean, Very moist in the book. If you the word moist in your book, it'll carry a lot of water for you. Uh, <laughs> people won't even notice. They're like, what was this book about? I don't know. It was scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Eric. Stop saying that. Well, I think McKenna's coming back on. And, uh, this is this is just a for, for anybody that knows the two of us. This is just this is just a small dose of what you can get the next time you have us in person. So anyway, look, I just I just texted the event coordinator of the store and said this is the most genuinely delightful event I have sat back and watched in I don't know how long. So I could watch you guys talk. Uh, no safe word needed, except that we have questions and I want to make sure we get to them. So, okay. Um, here we go. And we have eight zillion comments. And so it's going to take me a second to find the actual questions in amongst the comments, but here we go. Um, how did PJ come up with the idea for his book? Yeah. Just trying to, uh, again, create like the most high stakes uh, thing I could imagine, um, but but make it gay like me so that I could make it gay um, and, wow. and draw and all that stuff. Um, wow. And so I was like, well, you know, getting almost murdered in a bathhouse um, in chapter one seemed like a pretty good, good way to do that. Um, and then I had to figure out, well, how the hell did the character get there? Why, you know, what's going on? What drove them there? And how can I Keep, how can I make people root for for uh, this this person within a very few uh, amount of pages uh, who's doing something that most of us would be like you know judgmental towards on at uh, face value if we didn't really understand what was going on? Excellent. Okay, this one is for both of you. Um, is there ever a point where you pull back from a scenario thinking, nah, they wouldn't actually manage to get out of that? Why don't we start with you, Sean? Um, no. I don't. I think as a writer, the challenge for me is creating an incredibly difficult situation and then figure out a semi plausible way for my character to get out of it. Because all writing consists a little bit of the suspension of disbelief. And so if you can play with that in a way that you convince, you know, you cajole the reader to go along with you, you know, if you go too far, then the reader's like checks out mentally. But I, I find that I take that as a challenge. You know, all, all writing to me is putting my characters in a tree. And then throwing rocks at them. So I, I take it as a challenge to make outrageous situations. Although I will say there are scenarios in as far as violence where I have to pull back. Like no, 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 that's that's too gross. Nobody would do that with a drill. So <laughs> power tools again. <laughs> All right, how about you, PJ? I, I mean, can I just take Sean's answer? Because yeah. it sounds better. Uh, than, but I, I, well, but I love the way that you frame that because it really is like, yeah, it has to be semi-plausible. And that's like, I would have just stumbled my way through that answer, but that's that's what I, I feel. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a puzzle to put together. I'm always like, let's make it worse. Let's make it worse. Um, so, you know, a, a comfortable reader remembers they have to go to the bathroom. Um, so, you know, I'll get into these situations and I'm like, oh, well, there's a puzzle now I have to, I have to figure out in a way that's semi plausible, um, uh, because as a reader, I'm not, I'm not there for, uh, you know, some sort of realistic everything. I'm there for a story that's going to be entertaining. Um, so that's what I do. And same thing on the violence, the sex, all that stuff. I always try to like, you know, take it to 11 at a draft uh, and then have someone else come in and say, too much, pull it back. Fair enough, fair enough. All right, um, Bathhouse reads like a series on HBO that I benched. PJ, who would you dream cast as Oliver and Nathan or any other characters? Ooh, um, I not not name dropped, but uh, Kathy Klein, the uh, awful mother of Nathan, who's like you know a Lucille Bluth that's great on the page, but you'd hate in real life. Someone someone at a book club mentioned um, <laughs> Jessica Lang, and I was like, I'm the author. That's canon now. It's her. Um, and uh, I, I guess Oliver and Nathan. I said, I said a couple. I don't know. Like I kind of like the idea of like um, an Ezra Miller character for Oliver, who's who's younger. Um, and has, has done broody roles so like these like powerful powerhouse very dark roles so well and then I love like 
um, the idea of like a Neil Patrick Harris uh, for, for Nathan, because I think of like his role in Gone Girl, which was so creepy, but also like uh, Sean was saying earlier, is able to engender sympathy and and you know you really could see yourself rooting rooting for him uh, to 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 fix things um, as well and there is a generational difference between uh, those two queer characters and and how they navigate the world so those would be three for me I guess excellent Sean have you cast anyone in Blacktop Wasteland or uh, Razorblade Tears. I will say Razorblade Tears when I originally wrote it in my mind, Buddy Lee was Sam Elliott and uh and Ike was Delroy Lindo. Uh so those are my dream cast. I don't know what's gonna happen with it because it has been an option for a movie, so yay. Um but those that's who I was thinking of when I wrote it. Uh but I don't know. I could see Matthew McConaughey and, and Denzel Washington uh being the leads as well. I'd be happy with anybody. You know, if a movie ever comes out and it has a title card that says based on I'm good. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to survive a movie because like the books read as movies and they're very experiential. And I'm like, I don't know if I can handle the movie. <laughs> I'll handle it. I'll buy five tickets. <laughs> I think you. That's the Thank right you. answer. I appreciate that. That's the right answer. I'll deal with I will say. Later. I will say scrolling through the comments to find the questions, I am reminded of my favorite moment of the chat when Sean said that was his spicy hot tea. Someone also enjoyed that. So <laughs> it's great. It's a great line. Um, <laughs> right. um, here's a question regarding bathhouse was double day, the first publisher to take it right away or were others interested and did they want it the way you envisioned it? Yeah. Um, I, I got to say double day was the first uh, publishing house that wanted it. Um, right away, like I said, um, my editor Rob was was like kind enough to, and, and loved the story enough to sort of give me a shot to kind of make it a little bit there, um, you know, or, or to get it to the point where you know he, he was like, let's let's do this thing. Um, but no, I, I I published it with a different publisher because um, you know it it didn't get the enthusiastic response. Um, that myself and, and my agent Chris Bucci, who if there's any writers tuning in looking for an agent. Um, Sean's agent's great. My agent's great. They're wonderful people. Uh, but but he he was looking for that response and he didn't get it. Um, and you know it was that was disappointing because there was a moment where a lot of those fears of why I didn't write that story to begin with um, were validated um, in in a certain way. Um, and I didn't quite accept the rationale behind that. And so I you know we went out and, and took it on submission. And of course, every book racks up plenty of rejections during that process. And, and plenty of them were the good old fashioned rejections that everyone gets. Um, and then there were other ones. Um, and I, I know, Sean, you're shaking your head too, because you got them, you know, like it's, you get those rejections yeah. where you're like, oh, it's not about the book, is it? You know, I'll take my things. Exactly, exactly. A shout out to to the public <laughs> yeah. or, or putting these taking on the and look at what happens when you do like with blacktop wasteland when like wins at, you know sean you just said maybe you know 10 years ago would have been a different story but what book it gets all of these awards what book it's option what book gets you know there's a business case for when you write for readers because readers look a lot like all of us here um and not not uh, some sort of monolithic block and that's who buys the books and decides. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. We have a very specific question here from Nikki. Um, hi, Nikki. Would you ever write a heist novel? Nikki with you, I would. That's <laughs> Nikki Dolson. <laughs> I, 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 Shout out to Nikki Dolson. <laughs> I'm saying, if you, yeah, if you'll, if you'll do it, I will. <laughs> Or I'd love to be. I like, gotta give a shout like out to Nikki real quick. <laughs> I gotta Please. give a shout out to Nikki real quick. Nikki Dolson is one of the great writers of suburban gothic fiction, and, and more people need to read her stuff. Nobody understands the interior workings of a relationship and the interior workings of a particular type of man and woman who live in the suburbs the way Nikki Dolson does. So shout out to Nikki. Also, shout out to Josh Gessler, my agent, who took a big chance on me. Um, you know, the, the country guy from the South who, you know, uh, uh, you know, doesn't exfoliate properly and is always being fussed at about getting a manicure. Uh, so, yeah, I appreciate that. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. 
and love and other criminal behavior of amazing short story collection by Nikki. Just finished that not all that long ago. Y'all go pick that up. It is you'll each story is just a shot to the heart. Pulp fiction. And I beat you to the punch. The link is in the comments. Oh, perfect. So, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, we we've got that in there right now. If in case you're interested in uh, checking out Nikki's book. Um, Okay, it is 7.59, it is time, we are we are done. You guys, this has been such a delight. Thank you so much. Um, I'll mention once again, um, Bath House is out and uh, we are getting signed book plates. So if you order a copy, you'll get a signed book plate with it. Um, obviously we have copies of Blacktop Wasteland and Paperback um, and then Razorblade Tears is available for pre-order. And if you order in the next week or so, you can still get a signed or personalized copy. You can just put the personalization information in the comments when you order and Sean will be signing those and personalizing them for us. So um, thank you again both so much. It's been an absolute delight on this end. The audiences adored it as well. Um, and everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for having us. I appreciate it. Thank you. My, Good my night. Good see you again. Love you, PJ. <laughs> Love you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you all for tuning all in. Right.